Good evening, everyone. It's really great to see a crowd like this. Uh, this is really fantastic. Uh, thank you all for coming. My name is Tom Nock, and I'm the chairman of the Clements Department of History. And on behalf of the department and the Center for Present, uh, Presidential History, I'm really honored to welcome you to this inaugural event, uh, the first event of this year's Sharp Lecture Series, which is the history of Asian Americans in the building of the United States. Uh, so thanks again for coming. Um, before we get underway, I want to say a couple of things. I, our department is able to offer programs like this um, due to the generous gift of the late Ruth Sharp Altshuler honoring her son, Stanton Sharp. And for about 30 years now, the Sharp Fund has enhanced the faculty research and teaching in the history department um, in all kinds of ways. I can personally attest, and I know all my colleagues can, uh, that uh, this gift has afforded all of us incalculably greater opportunities um, for the simply otherwise would not have been the case. And we're happy to have with us uh, this evening uh, our late benefactor's husband, uh, Dr. Kenneth Altshuler, who is um, now Emeritus Distinguished Chairholder in the Department of Psychiatry at UT Southwestern. Thank you, Kenneth. I also want to emphasize that this year, for the first time, CPH and history are a part and parcel of one another, but we've never really partnered for a Sharp series. And uh, this has been a really auspicious and edifying uh, collaboration. Uh, while, while I'm at it, actually, um, on Tuesday, October 22nd, in this very room, uh, CPH will be presenting possibly its single most important program so far in its distinguished history. This is an event that has been some years in the making, uh, an event involving high-level policymakers and top scholars in a day-long symposium, the last card in the deck inside George W. Bush's decision to surge in Iraq. Uh, that's going to be quite, quite a series of events that day. I also want to acknowledge and, and, and express our thanks uh, for the A. Kenneth Pye Family Endowment, which also has helped to make this, this program possible. I also want to offer my personal thanks to Jeff Engel, uh, Brian Franklin, and Ronald Spitz of CPH for their help in the run-up to this evening. Um, most of all, uh, my heartfelt thanks to my colleague Margie Evans, uh, our department's administrative assistant. Many of our undergraduates and graduate students know Margie as a welcoming presence in our main office as they come seeking all sorts of information. And I want you to know that there is virtually no aspect of this event that Margie has not had a major hand in shaping and in putting it all together to make it happen. So thank you, Margie, so much. And finally, to present our distinguished speaker, I want to introduce another special person, and that would be Dr. Lai Leon, a fellow at our Center for Presidential History and a senior fellow at SMU's Tower Center uh, for Public Policy and International Affairs. It was Lai Yi uh, who originated the idea for this most timely uh, lecture series, and among other many essential, many other essential things, uh, she identified the four superb scholars of Asian American history who will have visited SMU in the course of this academic year for the series. You might like to know that Dr. Leon has earned her bachelor's and PhD both at Yale, and she is the lead scholar for CPH's oral history project on uh, the post 9-11 policy in East and Southeast Asia. She teaches undergraduate courses on Islam and politics and on the politics of the Middle East and of Southeast Asia. She also serves as faculty advisor to the Asian Council. That's the umbrella organization of Asian and Asian American student groups at SMU. And she's participated in SMU's cultural intelligence initiative at its inception. 
uh, this event would not be taking place tonight had it not been for Dr. Leon's creativity, expertise, and leadership. So I welcome uh, Dr. Leon, please. Welcome. Very good evening, everyone. Uh, as Dr. Knox said, I'm Lai Liang, a fellow at the SMU Center for Presidential History. Let me join him in saying how exciting it is to see so many people here today. A special welcome to those of you attending the Sharp Lecture Series for the first time, and I think there are quite a few here uh, in that category. To those of you who helped spread the word to make this great turnout possible, we are very appreciative. In particular, warm thanks to Lisa Chang Arnett, sitting right here in the front, uh, who helped us to reach out to the local um, Asian community, uh, and to student leaders on the Asian Council uh, here on campus. Where are you? I think I saw some of you. There you are. Also, gratitude to Ann Peterson, curator of photographs at SMU's de Gaulier Library, who put together the beautiful slides of the Central Pacific Railroad that you see up there. And of course, I second everything that Dr. Nock has said about Margie Evans, who absolutely made this event possible. So one quick, uh, one quick note before I start in on the formal introduction. Our speaker's book, Ghosts of Gold Mountain, uh, is for sale in right here, uh, where Margie is sitting, to the back of the room, on your way out. And Dr. Chang will be signing copies after the lecture. We could not have found a better speaker to kick off this year's Stanton Sharp Lecture Series which focuses on the perspectives and experiences of Asian Americans in the making of the United States. It's my distinct honor to introduce Dr. Gordon Chang. Dr. Chang earned his PhD at Stanford, where he is now the Oliver H. Palmer Professor in Humanities and Director of the Center for East Asian Studies. Dr. Chang's scholarship and teaching explore the intersection of two important fields, often separated in the study of American history. U.S. foreign relations, and race and ethnicity in America. In 2015, he published a highly acclaimed book entitled Fateful Ties, The History of America's Preoccupation with China. It richly captures four centuries of U.S.-China interactions. It paints a mosaic of cultural, educational, and business links, as well as personal bonds that reveal multiple layers of connections between the people of the two countries. Dr. Chang argues that such connections inform the making of America itself. For too long, traditional scholarly accounts ignore the global dimension of our national narrative or view it as merely a side note. Dr. Chang's most recent work continues that theme, but with a sharper focus on the human element of that global dimension. Dr. Chang leads a multidisciplinary research project at Stanford that aims to recover the stories of Chinese railroad workers in North America. One result is the groundbreaking book, Ghosts of Gold Mountain, the one on sale, Ghosts of Gold Mountain, the epic story of the Chinese who built the transcontinental railroad. It has been described as a breathtaking account that restores a group of American pioneers to their rightful place in our national history. In his scholarship, Dr. Chang brings from out of the shadows underrepresented voices and forgotten encounters. He raises profound questions about history and how we think about our collective past. His work is timely. Today, as ever, we tussle with who and what made America, to whom America belongs, and what America ought to be. I've no doubt that in the course of this evening's lecture, Dr. Chang will have much to add to that important conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Gordon, Gordon Chang.
Are we set? Okay, good. Thank you for those uh, lovely in introductions, uh, Dr. Leung, and thank you to Southern Methodist University for hosting me here. Thank you, Professor Nock, Professor Engel from the Center for Presidential Studies. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Thank you, Dr. Altshuler and your family's generosity. Uh, you and many other Americans around the country fund events such as this, which is one of our great uh, uh, enjoyments, I was thinking, of, of our civic, uh, of our society, to be able to share knowledge to the general public, open and free. Thank you. Um, it's the first time I've been to Dallas, uh, and I learned that Dallas was made by railroads. And so Dallas is a real railroad town, just like Chicago, just like Omaha, and countless other cities across the United States. Perhaps that's one of the reasons why there's great interest in railroads. It's a story of ourselves in many ways. It's a story of the first, first great infrastructure of the world, and certainly of the United States. And the first great, you know, we now are in the era of the second great infrastructure with the internet, but the first was really the railroads. Before the railroads were constructed, the railroads began construction of some, uh, some uh, focus in the 1830s. But uh, the Transcontinental Railroad, which linked the coasts, was completed in 1869. So this is the 150th anniversary, this year is the 150th anniversary of the completion of that transcontinental line. Uh, there was a big celebration out in uh, Promontory uh, Summit, Utah, about an hour north, hour and a half north of Salt Lake City, another city that was made by railroads. Uh, I went out to it. There were 20, 25,000 others who went to that dusty, lonely, desolate place north of the Great Salt Lake to celebrate the, the construction, the completion 150 years ago of the railroad. And what captivates some people's imagination is, to, is this simple fact. That is, before the railroad was completed, do you know how long it took to get from New York to San Francisco or San Francisco to New York? It would take six weeks, two months, two and a half months, months to get from one coast to the other. Six to, let's just say six to eight weeks. After it was completed, it took six to eight days. And that transformed the country. It transformed the world in part. I was speaking to somebody uh, uh, earlier today. Uh, the Transcontinental Railroad, complete, the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, almost at the same time as the completion of the Suez Canal, transformed the globe. It made possible everyday people to think about the world as a unit, as something that's embraceable, and it also inspired the famous writer Jules Verne to write uh, Around the World in 80 Days. He got the inspiration for that book by reading in a Paris cafe, as we all do, you get some inspiration in a Paris cafe, <laughs> having some coffee, but he actually did it. We read in the newspaper one day, and he read about the completion of almost simultaneously of these two great construction projects which meant that an Englishman, uh, forget his name, the David Niven character in the movie, goes around the world in, an, uh, as, in a fantastically short period of 80 days, which is now long, but for that time it was unimaginable. And he was able to do so because he was able to go through the Mediterranean and go through the Suez Canal and get around that way, instead of going all the way down to Africa and go all the And it also meant that as he came across the Pacific, he landed in San Francisco and was able to take the train across the biggest obstacle to getting around the world in some efficient fashion, and that was North America. And you just couldn't, couldn't go, otherwise you'd have to go around one of three routes before the Transcontinental Railroad was completed. You could go from New York, go down to Panama, take the ship down, the vessel down the Atlantic coast, go to Panama, get off the ship, Find some way to get across Panama. Hopefully you don't get Larry or cholera or something like that, which was a very dangerous place. And people died all the time through that track. Get to the Pacific side of Panama, and then wait for another vessel to go up to get you to San Francisco. <clears throat> that was one route one. Um, probably the most commonly used route. The second, another route was to take a ship all the way down to Cape Horn, the tip of South America, way down there. Uh, and that was perilous, the length, 
the storm, the sea, and getting through that strait, and then come all the way back up. You can ask why it took 60, at least 68 weeks. Or the third route, which had its own perils, and that was to get a train. There were trains already established throughout the East Coast and reaching out toward the Midwest. You get a train out to Omaha, Nebraska. You get off the train, and then you walk. <laughs> or maybe get a horse. You know, the horse could survive, or you could survive. And you had to get through uh, unsettled territory, Native American lands, which was still controlled and owned and cherished by them. And now folks were trekking through the area to get out to Oregon country, California. And they didn't like that. But so a lot of people got through, they tried to get through, and then they would hit the Sierra. I, I don't know, some of you have I'm sure, flown this route. I, I was, I was, the first time I'd been to Dallas, so we, I flew out from San Jose and flew over the Sierra Nevada. I had not seen the Sierra Nevada from the Atlanta point. And after it got over the crest, and it looked back, and all of a sudden I hit Nevada. And I saw the eastern slope of Nevada. And some of you this around your head, you know what? The eastern slope of Nevada, you know, Nevada is very rocky and then hilly. It's a high plateau. And then it hits California, Earth, and the Sierra Nevada literally goes up like this. It goes vertically up like this. It doesn't slowly w rise to Lake Tahoe, it goes straight up. And it's a dramatic scenery. So that's what <coughs> travelers would face when they were coming east, coming from the east, going to the west. They would hit that, get through Nevada, and they're still living, uh, got food supplies, and they would start to trek up into the Sierra and hopefully not get caught by a winter storm or the early winter, which unfortunately, the infamous or the tragic Donner Party that happened to them. They got caught in an early winter storm, and they could not get through the passes. They could not, they got stuck at near the crest of the Sierra, and they couldn't move, they couldn't go forward or backward, and they got stuck there, and they had the tragedy that we know as the Donner Party, where they resorted to cannibalism to survive. Those were the three ways you could get to California, <laughs> if you were alive, if to, to make it all the way through. Now, <clears throat> That story is dramatic. It's also dramatic, the railroad, the transcontinental is a dramatic story because it's become symbolic. The railroad is symbolic of the reestablishment of national unity after the Civil War. Civil War is over and this unity, now the railroad is a physical link that brings the country together, you said. And it is a great engineering and construction accomplishment, a national accomplishment. And so it's celebrated as a national achievement, which it was. But it's also sort of overlooked in that, that telling that this was very much an international story, which I've alluded to already, but an international story in another dimension. And that is that the western portion of the Transcontinental Railroad was built almost entirely by aliens, by non-Americans. So that complicates, as we were talking about here, the story of, of our story, of, of, of the national pageant, rise of the West, and so forth. And that, impar that was largely also a foreign foreigners, because Chinese could not become American citizens by law. We could not, could not enjoy privileges of naturalization until all the way up until 1943. So this title of the talk today, and I want to go through some of this here, and, I have lots so much to talk about and to share with you, and I want to make sure we have time to have discussion. And I'm not sure where we came up with this title. I don't know if this was my title, but it actually it works. And, and it works because it seems it captures this basic point that I'm making, which is they're alien Chinese rail workers in American national history. The two seem to be quite separate, but in fact they're right, right interconnected. And that's what I want to show about uh, some today. Now, the railroad story is <clears throat> told in various ways, but all the dominant narrative, a dominant story, sort of sim is, is represented by the glitz and glam glamour of the golden spike, which really does exist. There is a golden spike. And when you come out to my university, come, I invite you all to come to Stanford <laughs> and go to the art museum, and you can see the golden spike. It's in the art museum. But here's a secret just among ourselves. It, what you'll see in the museum is fake. <laughs> is not the real golden spike, it's too valuable. The real golden spike is in the vault, and this is a replica. But nevertheless, it looks pretty real. 
And this is a picture of that. Well, I'm not sure if it's the replica or the, the, uh, the real thing. But on it is inscribed, this is what was used uh, ceremoniously at the driving of the completion of the railroad line in May 10th, 1869. Leland Stanford, the benefactor of our university, uh, used a silver mallet and sort of <coughs> tapped it like this, and it done, as it was said, that the word went out on telegraph wires around the country instantly done this big, most ambitious construction project to date uh, was, was completed. As, as parenthetically, this event is sometimes said to be the first uh, uh, national experience, uh, the first moment experienced literally nationally at the, at the same time, because now you had telegraph wires, because the telegraph wires went, corresponded with the construction of the railroad line went along the same lines. And so the railroad, so now the country literally is now linked by rail, but also by wire. And so the telegraph went out, done. It was picked up in Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., New York City, Boston, everywhere, heard about this. San Francisco, everyone within a second of each other heard the news. So it's really fascinating. Now, we, we experience, experience all this simultaneously all the time now, but that was, some people say, the first. It's interesting. Now, so, but there is all this glitz around this. There's also uh, this uh, celebrated with this famous photograph by A.J. Russell, photographer who was hired by the Union Pacific Line. As you know, there were two railroad companies that were hired uh, to build a line, and the Union Pacific built from east from Omaha to out to Salt Lake, to Salt Lake and the Central Pacific, which I'll speak about today, from west to east. And they meet at this promontory. So, I mean, this is a moment, uh, this is a scene moments after the driving or the tapping of the golden spike. And it is, a, it's, it's called by Russell, uh, East and West Shaking Hands. Again, a metaphor of re national reunion. Now, uh, many people think this is wonderful. It shows everyday people celebrating, the engineers are shaking hands. These are not workers, actually, most by and large. If you look at their clothes, it's a fascinating photo. You can see European clothes, you see looks like Polish hats, Irish boots, Native American moccasins. Also, it's really a fascinating photo in itself. But uh, some people really are upset by this photo, particularly uh, the, some in the Chinese American community who say they're upset because we're the Chinese. They were excluded, or are they excluded? From the, they're not in the frame, they're not in the photo, they're not in the history. And this is symbolic of that erasure, that neglect. Now, I started, when I started this project seven, eight years ago, it was actually a lifetime project of mine, um, but I, one of the first things I did was to go to this California State Railroad Museum, great museum up in Sacramento, um, and, to, and to look at an enlargement of this photo, and there's a one that's almost the same size as what you see here. And I looked at it really carefully, and I told my wife the story, and we were examining, is that really true? And she says she thought she, yeah, there is a Chinese guy in there. And this just went flew in the face of all sorts of, you know, views and feelings about it in anger. And I looked and I said, by golly, you're right. Does anybody see him? It looks like you see if you found him. You can't see his face. He's about the only fellow in the photo that you can't see a face. You see his back. And he's right in the middle of the photograph. He's got a floppy hat on, a long work coat, which is tattered and patched and sore. And he's a bit hunched over and he's moving. And again, you know, it's, I couldn't stage this any better. He's blurry. He's not distinct. He's not clear. Everybody else is frozen because they, this is glass plate photography. So you just hold still for a couple of seconds. But he just really gives a, he doesn't care. You know, he's not there. He's been working and he's moving to doing something. But he's there. And there's also maybe someone else, uh, and we don't have, uh, it's been cropped. We don't have uh, the original negative, but there might have been somebody else on one of the edges. But, and, he, and there might be a couple of people in the, in the midst of the crowd kind of covered, covered up. But so my project has been, uh, again, to, to use as a meta, uh, this as an analogy, is that I'm trying to reclaim that fellow in the frame. He's there, we haven't seen him, but he's right in the middle of it, and that's what I've tried to do. 
So this is, a, my effort has been to try to recover a hidden history, hidden right in front of our faces. Now, <clears throat> this has not been an easy, it's been a heck of a difficult task because there has not been, we have not found a single document written by a Chinese railroad worker that tells anything about their experience. Uh, I we estimate something like 20,000 labored on the western portion. 90% of the Central Pacific Railroad workforce were Chinese. But we haven't found a single letter, diary, memoir, oral history, no letter back home, no letter found here, nothing. Nothing published, unpublished. So as a historian, and many of you are historians or love history, you know, we, we believe history is recovered through documentation. We just don't make it up. We have need evidence. So what evidence am I going to use to recover what was called a lived history, a history of their felt experience, what they actually went through. Not just as, as some of the shadowy fiction, picture, uh, figure in a picture, but what they experienced. How did they live? How did, and they, and many of us, I think, are interested in social history. We're all you know, everyday people, and we want to know how everyday people lived. But it's really hard to get at that. We have the histories of presidents and generals and so forth. And that captivates us, but also the history of everyday people, and sometimes there's much less evidence, much less, because we don't think, most people think we're not very important, so we're not going to keep our stuff, or we're not going to keep our diaries to say how we lived, what we felt, what we uh, cried about, and so forth. It's everyday people. But that's sort of what I wanted to do. But how do we do that absent documentation? So I leave that as a rhetorical question there, and this is what I'll try to get at. Now, it, the story, on. Uh, uh, in contrast, is revolves around uh, the big men of history, such as Leland Stanford. And this is an early biography of Stanford. Uh, Leland Stanford, war governor of California. He was a Republican, first Republican governor of California, uh, uh, a, a, an associate of Abraham Lincoln. Stanford had been a wealthy business person in California, uh, and he was the uh, governor of California during the Civil War. Uh, railroad builder, so we attribute to him the credit of building the railroad. Uh, he was president of the Central Pacific Railroad and founder of Stanford University. And we celebrate the, in California, and some of you may know, was called the Big Four, the Big Four guys. So Leland Stanford calls Huntington, it's connected to the Huntington Library in Southern California. Huntington, everywhere you see a Huntington, Southern California is connected to Huntington, or in New York, they held big, the Huntington's were also New Yorkers. Uh, Charles Crocker and uh, Mark Hopkins. So this is usually the stories told from their vantage point and uh, focus upon them. Now this is a, a, a story, of course, very much connected to Stanford University, which carries Leland's name. And uh, I gave you two stories, anecdotes. So I want to, I got to talk faster here. Is there are two stories that are often given about the red ruse of Stanford University. And I heard this literally just two weeks ago when I took a sort of surreptitious tour with a, a student guide. You know, I'm sure you have them here. They walk and tell you what all the buildings were and how great it is to come to SMU and Stanford, whatever. So this uh, tour guide, a, a lovely undergraduate, is talking about it. Uh, he said, do you know why Stanford's roofs are red? And he said, because, and this is a story, of course, that Jane Stanford, his mother, Leland Stanford was their, her son. He tragically died of cholera when they were doing the grand tour of Europe when he was a teenager, and they built the university to memorialize it. So that's literal, that's the story. And it said, he said that it was, they read because Jane Stanford wanted to make sure that her son could see his university from heaven, that he would look down and see the red roofs of his university. Five years earlier, a friend of mine, son of Chinese American laundry folks in Los Angeles had heard about my project. He said, you know, my mom once asked me, completely separate, why do you know, Eddie, do you know why Stanford's roofs are red? Same question. He says, I don't know why, Mom. He said, There's, because they're staying with the blood of Chinese railroad workers. So it's, it's, this is, again, what I'm dramatizing here, the different tellings of history, different perspectives of history, how we get at history and what history means to us in from different positions. Now to further this, this is, I show you this, this is a, a big painting about this size up in Sacramento. 
and it's called Driving the Last Bike. Hill was a famous California artist <clears throat> in the late 19th century, a favorite of Leland Stanford's, and Stanford commissioned this to try to dramatize Leland's central, literally, role in The Last Spike, and it's called Driving the Last Spike, as if Leland really drove the last spike. And this is what we call hagiography, you know, hero worship. And uh, it's hagiography, uh, uh, although lots of different elements are placed into it, and I, the poetry, I can't do this very well, but there are Chinese sort of on their knees before the great guy, and uh, others who are in great respect of the great man. Uh, the artist also included a legend where many of the, those in attendance in the, in the fainting, painting are identified by name. Now they're big wigs and political figures and so forth. The trouble with this painting, which is presented to us as history, is, as we, the popular word goes now, fake. It never happened. This, never, this scene never happened. It was never gathered. These people never, never gathered in such a way. They were never assembled in such a way. This, Lee Stanford never stood like this. It's all imagined, made up to celebrate him. So that, that's, you know, that's common and, and all like but the issue here, and, and we know this is uh, inaccurate, I'll use that euphemism, because there are people in the painting who were, had already passed away. <laughs> and they're reinserted in the photo because they had played a role in California history, including the first, one of the first leaders of the railroad effort, a man, some of you may be from San Francisco, Theodore Judah. And there's a Judah Street in San Francisco. And Theodore Judah had been part of the Big Four. He was the Big Five when he was alive. But Theodore Judah was sent, some people said, by, by conspiracy, by Collis Huntington and others. He said, go back to New York and raise money. So he got on his vessel, went down to Panama, walked across Panama, contracted malaria, and died on his way to New York. But he's in the photo, he's in the painting, because people honor, want to honor Theodore Judah. Now, I show you this photograph on the right, also by A.J. Russell, the one who took the meaning of East and West, minutes before East and West. But if you look at the photograph and the painting, you look, I see the painting is based on the composition of the photograph, which did happen. I mean, he captured that moment. So that is real. The photograph is real in, in that particular moment, but you can see that Thomas Hill used the same uh, composition, the railroad line, the diagonals, the approaching engine, the, the uh, phalanx of, uh, of, the, of the audience uh, looking in like this, the bucket on the road, the telegraph wires, all the elements in the photograph, Hill employs, right? I mean, you can, I hope that you can see that, you know, it's, it's except he, he rearranges the people. I mean, and, the and the Chinese who are in the A.J. Russell photo, he will entitled the photo, Chinese laying the last rail. That's what A.J. Russell entitled his photo, are laying the last rail. You can see them there, the floppy hat and the long hair, just like that guy who was in the photo, right? So this is the people who laid the last rail. And 50 years after that moment, the railroad companies celebrated this and they brought, they found three fellows who they claimed to have been part of the crew that laid the last rail and took, they brought them out and they dressed them in this way and they said, these are these three guys who were laying the last rail. And they, they dressed them in a way, they didn't dress that way, but, and they don't look very happy. I mean, they're, they're out of retirement, they're in their 70s and 80s, and the railroad companies said, here they are and we'll honor them and so forth. So that was nice because it did remind many people of the role the Chinese played in that moment. But you can see here what I'm suggesting is how, to really, for us to think about how history is written, not written, or falsely presented, and how it's a constant effort to try to get it right, to try to uh, recover a better history. Now, <clears throat> I don't have time to go through a lot of the specifics of the railroad other than to say that the idea of a transcontinental railroad has been long standing, going back to the 1840s. Uh, many Americans thought, at least had, you know, saw the map of the United States, of, the, of North America, and that a rail line was really needed to, to, to span the continent, in part because 
they understood that the United States had a unique global position. And that global position was a cipher, if you will, between U Europe and the Far East. And there was North America. Columbus bumped into it, and it was an obstacle. But they saw now this America's manifest destiny. In America's destiny was to link Europe and Asia. And the railroad was necessary to make to really realize to be that link. And also economically, it made so much sense. You have a rail line politically, militarily, all this idea that you need a railroad. But for 20, more than 20 years, about 20 years, the project stalled because of the sectional crisis. The Congress could not decide on the route, a northern route, a central route, a southern route because of the sectional crisis, and they all knew that the railroad was going to have immense implications, political, military, economic, for wherever the route went. So it got stalled until after the outbreak of the Civil War, and now Congress is free to decide on these things, and Lincoln very early on signs the bill to authorize federal support for the railroad. So that's how the railroad comes to be when it starts in 1862 and really in earnest 1863. Lincoln himself was a railroad lawyer. He, he knew about railroads. He had been a railroad lawyer, represented railroads in Illinois. Now, the railroad had different the railroad companies. They were sanctioned uh, off that new, uh, sanctioned the Central the Union Pacific and Central Pacific. They had the problem of capital, labor, and terrain. You know, big, area, big areas of challenge for it for them. Capital, federal government provided a lot of that. Labor, the Union Pacific, uh, didn't have too much of a problem because it was coming about from the populations from the East and the Midwest, and then after the Civil War, the South. Uh, but the uh, Union, the Central Pacific, had two big problems lack of labor way out on the West Coast and the terrain. So you have the plain states that the, that, the, were, that the Union Pacific faced, and you can see the red line there. Uh, where it went and snaked across uh, the terrain there and made its way uh, to, to to Utah. Uh, and so you can see these photos sort of dramatize the difference between the terrain. So the Central Pacific, the U, people thought the big four were crazy. They thought they were nuts. That they say, how are you going to be able to get a railroad through the Sierra Nevada? It's impossible. It's the most rugged, difficult mountain range on the continental the United States. And the weather conditions are abominable. You have a very short uh, construction season. We, we don't feel it here, right? In 190 degree Dallas, but right now it's snowing in the Sierra. It's already snowing. So winter has begun. And it will stop, and there will still be snow on the ground until July. People up at Lake Tahoe, you can, sometimes you can snow into July. So you have a very short period of time to work to get through that. So, but that was the problem, and the Central Pacific was, uh, did not want to hire Chinese at first uh, for, for prejudice reasons and other reasons. They wanted to hire just white workers, but the call went out for workers, and a few hundred showed up. And in a couple of years, they only made a few dozen miles of progress. And finally, out of desperation, they said, someone said, Charles Crocker said, 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 suggested, let's try these Chinese, who had been in the state since the early 1850s and worked on mining in construction projects and so forth. Were labor, many of them were laborers. And they tried 50 at first, more, another 50, another 50. And by the end of 1864, early 1865, there were 3,000. 3,000 workers of one ethnicity working on one construction project. And by 1865, there were 10 to 15,000. I mean, it was a big, a big, no, this was a big project. A lot, of, a lot of people were necessary. And they proved themselves to be really capable workers. And to the shock or surprise and delight of the railroad barons, they did the work. More than what was expected of them, they proved really capable, efficient, uh, skillful, in, uh, endurance and dedication. And also they were, could pay them less. So they were inexpensive. And the railroad companies benefited in many different ways. Railroad companies made very uh, advantages through using them. And you can see this was soon after the completion of the railroad, and there's all sorts of attention to the railroad line, and newspapers around the country are talking about this transcontinental line. And this newly founded Scientific American, which we still have, writes, publishes this essay article 
which says in part, this is a long article, this is just a couple of paragraphs from it, you can read it yourself, but you see it's quite, it's really laudatory. They work hard and the industry is unflag unflogging, unflagging and his strength and endurance are wonderful and his mechanical skill is remarkable, which is interesting because they're not just hard, uh, uh, they're not just laborers, you know, strong backs and strong arms, but they're skillful and we, when we look at it more carefully, we see a lot of them worked as masons, as carpenters, handling explosives, tunnelers, and very difficult, dangerous work. Uh, but as I said, we have these testaments, if you will, observed, te observed testament from many different journalists at the time. They couldn't communicate with the Chinese. So one of my tasks is to try to think about what it might have meant to be one of these fellows in these photos that you do see. And we do have photos of Chinese workers but nothing of testimony from them. But instead of just seeing them as part of a mass here, I try to place myself in that position and invite you to think about what it would be to be standing in the snow here, if you're from southern China, semi-tropical southern China, and now you're working up here in the Sierra in 30 to 40 foot snow drifts, and you're still wearing your sun hat, woven hats, which I mean, maybe kept the top of their head warm, but it's kind of, or maybe they had some, some fondness for wearing headgear that they were familiar with. But you can see some of these photos and try to think about them working in these conditions. And all it is said with some, uh, I, I, first I thought this phrase was silly, but I sort of come to like it. Someone would say, well, you mean the railroad was an artisanal effort? And I said, what do you mean artisanal? He said, well, it was all hand done. I said, well, maybe it is artisanal. You know, you know like your meals, artisanal meal or wine or something like that. But it's true, it was all hand done. There was no mechanical. Uh, mechanization, no hydraulics, no steam this. It was all picks, axes, black powder, carts, wheel, uh, carts, shovels, horses at the most, and um, you know, to make the construction. So it was artisanal and that was, it was hand done. All miles of the track, uh, on the Central Pacific track. The Union Pacific had some. By the way, how, do you know how many miles the two companies claimed to have constructed from Omaha to Sacramento. When I tell you the number, you, you, you know, it should be very, it's, it's a simple number. Just co as a coincidental number, 1,776 miles. <laughs> just, just coincidentally. They claim they boasted, we built 1,776 miles of the railroad. They put it in the newspapers. I'm not making it up. Uh, maybe they did, but I did, you know. <laughs> so there are photos, and I'm going to go through some of these more quickly now to give you some sense of the lived experience um, that uh, we, we see. So the Alfred Hart, and you saw some of the great photos earlier in the slide deck, uh, some of them which you also are going to be using. And, and, the, and there's there are people in these photos, but usually not, you know, not given prominent place because Alfred Howard was hired by the Central Pacific Railroad to dramatize and to celebrate the Central Pacific. He was a company man. He was a great photographer, but he's interested in working for, working for the company and helping the company, and the company wanted to dramatize its work and particularly to appeal to investors back in the East Coast and in Europe. So they saw these, these magnificent photos of the terrain and the difficulty of the work. And this is one photo here, this uh, steam shovel. This was not used in construction. It was used, hopefully, to clear the track of snow. So then you have one Chinese man standing in front of it to show, again, kind of scale of, of things. And they could not use this steam uh, uh, this uh, uh, machine here in front of an engine to clear the track because it was so thick, snow was so thick it couldn't clear the snow. And so they had to use the Chinese, which are just these little figures here, had to get down out in the snow with shovels and clear away miles of snow, 30 to 40 foot snow. I mean, that's just before you can even do any of the construction work, which construction work would call, of course, uh, clearing the land, cutting down trees, putting the, uh, the road bed, and all, all the things that would uh, deaf work to build a railroad. Uh, it also, required going all through very difficult conditions, such as uh, here, while we're looking down, you see these travelers now looking down after the railroad was completed, to look uh, 1,400 feet, almost straight down, 
into the American River. And they had to work on these very, very dangerous conditions to uh, get uh, around this promontory. There are other photos which I think are really neat to look at. Now, you, you can't see any Chinese, you think, in this. But they, they, those are Chinese in the background. They're working on crew. But this was a cliff that sort of sloped down. And this is all gone now. So even though this is not, uh, and, and many other historians of uh, the railroad have looked at these, but never really thought about it, that this is the aftermath of the work of the Chinese workers. They just said, somehow this is done. But someone had to do it. And so what I'm trying to say in, in, in the book and talk about what it meant to work in such ways. We don't see the, the photographer, Hart was not interested to show the workers at work, but just the accomplishment. So there are other photos that show this. The railroad line has to be a sort of a, to, to, to rise in elevation as smoothly and gradually as possible, to go a, a route that does not have sharp turn. You know, think, think of what it takes to have a smooth functioning rail line. You had to fill in ravines such as this. You had to do cuts through rises. And you had to make trestles over large canyons. And you had to do tunnels, which I'll talk about in a moment. Now, the California uh, terrain is tough terrain, uh, beautiful terrain through dense conifer forests, a rugged ruggedness before you even get to the high Sierra. This is still the foothill here, uh, maybe 50, 80, 60 miles from Sacramento, east of Sacramento. But you can see now the, the railroad line literally being carved out of the wilderness. So the trees had to have been cut and all the land cleared away. Now, some of this you can have close up here. And you see someone had to move all this darn stuff. Uh, and sometimes there are interesting captions by Alfred Hart. One's called uh, Hornet Hill. And, and I know from other documents that well, they called it Hornet Hill because there were scads of hornets in this rise. And they had to clear those things. I try to imagine you know, being beset by hornets when you're trying to get through their uh, ground. Uh, others, sometimes you see it now they're all still. There's sort of stillness, there's stiffness in these photos because, again, it's glass plate photography. Uh, but again, it gives you some other idea of what kind of work had to be done. Now, uh, some of these photographs are, have quite an aesthetic quality to them, beautiful quality, such as this one. It doesn't mention anything about Chinese. This is on the eastern slope. And it's a small alpine pond. Uh, and we can see a fellow there with a shoulder pole and cans, maybe, for water. You can see them like that. So th th this is a, a settlement. He's, he's probably maybe a cook. He's doing something of Chinese up there near the summit. Uh, and some Chinese lived up there for a couple of years because the work took so much time. But with the great uh, advantage of digital technology and, mic and, and uh, magnifying glasses, I discovered there are two other people in this photograph. Ray in the back. You can kind of probably see them if you look carefully. And one of them has a white apron on, and the guy next to him, they're both Chinese, and the other has, looks like black silk clothes. So I ask you, what, what, what's the guy in the black, in the white uh, apron? Well, he's probably a butcher, right? So he's a cook. You have a water carrier, cook. Now who's the guy in the black silk? Might be a gambler opium deal, and they've tra traveled along the way. So this just this little hint that there were different types of Chinese along the rail line, different types. They're not just all laborers. And some of them were ne'er-do-wells, and some of them did all the things. And this guy who had the apron uniform, maybe he went on later on after the railroad was done and opened his restaurant in Chicago. So this is a, a, another fit, image of work that's been completed. They had to build these immense retaining walls that uh, to support the line as it snaked around these hills. And so you can see this retaining wall. I'll show another picture in a moment. This is another fascinating, beautiful photo of a Chinese tea carrier. It's, it's been uh, commonly called, but, uh, where he's carrying water to the workers. And in the background, there's the exit of a tunnel. And the tunnels were probably the most difficult thing to get to, to construct, because they were through solid granite. Not just composite, not just dirt, not some rock and stone, solid rock. And that's what the Sierra Nevada uh, is composed of. It's like your kitchen counter. You imagine that a zillion times. It's solid. Uh, and they had to blast through that rock. If you had a hammer and chisel 
uh, and you, you use like this, you do make about an inch of progress a day. It's so tough. So they had to use, they tried nitroglycerin for a while, it was very dangerous, a lot of people got blown up. Um, but they did 15 of these tunnels. How did they live? They lived outside in tent to cam camps such as this. This is uh, where uh, 50, 100, 200 uh, would live. In the camp train was the top engineer supervisor and white work skilled workers who were in those dormitory cars, but the Chinese workers lived outdoors. And a magnifying glass shows them. It's really interesting. I saw them walking. You can see them walking around, smoking, having a meal, washing their dirty laundry. Their laundry, you can see like this. You know, this is everyday life. This is probably a Sunday when they weren't working because they worked six days a week. Now, uh, this was the most difficult challenge. This was called Summit Tunnel, six, over 1,600 feet in length. It took two and two and a half years to get through. Just work, and working all year round. They worked also through the winter. Because the company said, well, look, you're, you're, you're not out in the snow, but you could work inside. But there's water. When we went to go visit the, in, in April sometime, the water was gushing through the rock. There were still icicles coming down. It was slippery. One of our people in our group slipped and broke his shoulder. I mean, and these, we were just tourists, you know, not, not work, work workers. Like that. But this is what it looks like looking down the gullet of a, a monster, I, I, I like to think. Uh, but this was a fascinating photo by Alfred Hart. The, the photo, the tunnel is not completed. It's stopped up at, way at the end. Oh, here's another kind of quiz for you. You are going to get a test. So I'm a professor. I give tests at the end. So, so how does one construct a tunnel from four directions? at the same time. How do you build foot? Just, shh, shh. Right, someone raise their hand. Sorry, all, you know, a student who always raises their hand gets called on. Yes. You drive a drive shaft, right. So one, two, shaft in the middle, three, four. And that's what they did. So it was not fast enough to go this way, not fast enough just to go this way, made a foot or so a day of progress, built a shaft from the top of the mountain, down, it's quite an engineering issue to find out where you think the line is going to go. You build a shaft down, hollow it out, and have people and material go up and down, and you have them work inside the gut, if you will, and get all the broken stone and stuff lifted out through, and then the, uh, the men as well. And I said men because they're all men. You know, the Chinese were all, all men, and no Chinese women who worked on it. This is a photo of the tunnel today, beautiful photo, photograph by a contemporary photographer. Uh, and now you can see it does go all the way through. Uh, now, after getting through the Sierra, it hit Nevada and the endless desert plateaus, coldness of the Utah winter and also of, of, uh, of Nevada, and other problems of building through the deserts, 110 degree wet. I mean, well, try to think of all these, these pieces of working conditions and living out in long periods of time on their own. Uh, Another quick question. What did they eat? What did the Chinese railroad workers eat? Pardon me? Rats? No, no. Rats? Rice. I'm sorry, rice. Yes, rice. People said at the time people were eating the Chinese ate rats. But they ate rice, yes. And they didn't eat they didn't eat corned beef and cabbage, which the Irish were. But they ate rice, and they ate other Chinese goods. So another more part of the story, there was, if, what, we, uh, what we learned is that there was a very sophisticated, and this goes for some of you who are interested in business history, su supply chain from southern China all the way out to Utah. And along the way, they would eat. They were very particular about what their diet was. They had Chinese cooks that said. So they ate rice grown in southern China. They ate dried fish for fish caught in South China seas. They ate dried, dried noodles, all the kind of stuff very nutritious, very light, reconstituted, rehydrated back along the way, and cooked by Chinese cooks, and they consumed by the workers. Soy sauce, rice wine, uh, all sorts of other spices and condiments. Well, I'm going to go through the quickly here. There are not many pictures. This is a fascinating picture of a crew. This was a stage photo. Why, I don't think it's maybe not clear enough. I can't tell from my vantage point. But you can look at the photo. This is one where you can see some faces, and you see how young they were. There's one guy who looks like he's about 15 years old or something like this. But they were young men uh, working there. Many died. 
maybe up to 1,200. It's no, the railroad company did not keep records. There was not good HR uh, in those days, and they, and they were also considered to be somewhat expendable. But through other means, we've calculated approximately 1,200. Pro probably, I say probably because we don't know conclusively. Say probably, and what is the evidence we have? One big form of evidence is the Chinese, uh, when they died and were buried in the Sierra, let's say, from a snow, from an avalanche or something like that, their remains remained in the ground, but they were tagged, the location, and years later, people would go back to exhume the remains, pack them up in special boxes, and send the remains back to China for final burial, because that was their existential requirement. They said, if I died in a foreign land, I must be buried back in my home village where my descendants will revere me, honor me, and you know, worship me, all that stuff. Because without that, they wouldn't go. Because without being interred for eternity in their home village, their soul, their spirit would wander aimlessly and, and suffer in the foreign land. So that was you know, terrifying. So we do have, this is one of the rare photos of an actual Chinese funeral. This is taken some years after. This is up in Boise, near, near, uh, near Sun Valley, Idaho. We, I visited this place this summer. And it's a fascinating photo. I don't have time to, to talk about the different elements in it, but it's, it's very, very interesting. Other evidence that we used besides photographs is there are some payroll records, and you see some names of Chinese on these. There were labor contractors. All 20,000 names are not on these photos, because, uh, the payroll records, because they were hired as contract workers. And so we have the names of the contractors, the businessmen who hired them, and they in turn hired the laborers or the workers. But we have some sense of names of this, and also the, what they were paid, and the categories, and so forth. We talked to uh, descendants of railroad workers. And there are lots of them. I don't know, maybe in this, in this room. Yeah, almost all the time, someone says, I you know, great, great, great grandpa was a railroad worker. And they want to know more about them. And so we went and we hunted down a number of families, including Maxine Hong Kingston here, as you see, uh, Lisa C., and some other authors, some of you may know, and talked, they heard about their family stories. But none of them had documents either. They had store, maybe stories handed down through generations. Now, the last, the last big area that was fascinating for me was the use of archaeology, uh, the study of found objects, the material culture uh, that the, the Chinese left behind. And archaeologists, scores of them, up, uh, we had 100 in our group who had been working on this uh, subject for years, independently, just because they were fascinating. And we discovered them, and they found us, and we collaborated. And they, they shared with us some of the things they had, had found years before such as this, back in the 1960s, um, Paul Chase was a pioneer uh, archaeologist and found these bowls just hanging out on the ground, literally hanging. They didn't have to dig. They didn't dig down like an archaeologist. They are just surface culture, surface material. And some of the materials, some of, or if you see in some museums up in the Truckee area, like Tahoe area, such as this, we were able to trace back the origin of some of this ceramic to actual specific kilns. Back in southern China, we analyzed the clay, the technique, and design, and so forth. We also went out to look at different sites, and you can see actual fire pits. It looks like a fire pit. This is a ranged thing. This is where they cooked. Maybe a big wok was here 150 years ago. We could look at the remnants of their work. Besides the railroad line, you could see what's called China Wall. This is the largest wall that exists. It's, it's huge. They, uh, I don't know. A, a purse, a, how big is this? You can see the tunnels entrance off to the left. So you can some that's a, a steam engine go, can go through there. So you can see some sense of how big this thing is. It's built like an upside down pyramid that's stuck into this uh, ravine here. And it was constructed by Chinese using a, a masonry technique they brought over, which was fitted stone. There is no mortar, nothing sticking these rocks together. It's all fitted stone, and it's lasted 150 years, more than 150 years. And people walk on it now, jump on, you know, this is, this is, and part of the, re, the, the value of having it fitted stone is that you're not making a reservoir, a dam, because you put mortar in, it stops the water, and eventually the water's going to come through. So the water comes through the rock, but the rock stays together. Really interesting. <coughs> 
Now the contemporary photo by the same photographer, beautiful. You know, this is Don, it's called Donner Lake because for the name of the, the tragic uh, Donner party. But you can see uh, the, the, these, these tunnels as they go through and a light sprinkling of snow <clears throat> on the ground. We also went out to the desert. This is, this is near Promontory Summit. This is, these photos were taken just this May. <coughs> we went out to a line, part of the line that's no use, that not used anymore. And but it was that we know from engineers and, and national parks people that there was a big area where was a chi large Chinese living camp and so forth. And we went through and walked around where the line used to go. And including looking on the ground, right on the ground, there's this stuff. Just shards of stuff, 150 years been sitting there. Uh, I can't tell if you can see this, right? You can see this on here? Yeah, just this broken bottles, broken jar, containers. You can pick, people pick them up. Now, archaeologists hate when we do this, or hate what you do, if you do this, because we're disturbing their laboratory, right? Because they want to know exactly where everything was, and they map the stuff out because they try to reconstruct some history from the actual physical locations and the orientation of these things. <coughs> but you know, this is Chinese, this is stuff. So just to end, thank you for your attention and interest. We have, as Professor Nock mentioned, two books, or like you mentioned, uh, two books. One is this book, it's a volume of scholarship, about 20, 20, two essays uh, in this volume uh, of, of uh, historians and archaeologists and, and others. And then this is the book uh, that I wrote with a commercial press uh, from New York and which is uh, available tonight and um, so this is where I try to tell their story to present for us today their lived experience. So thank you for your attention and I'm hoping we can have some discussion. Thank you Gordon, that was terrific. We have uh, two microphones here if you want to come up and ask a question, I'll let you negotiate that. Um, my question is and you uh, about you talk about why they start uh, when at the beginning they didn't they try not to recruit Chinese workers. Uh, but later, uh, for one reason was kind of prejudice, but you said that there are some other reasons. And what are they? And that's actually one question. And then another question is, is it the, are they the same reasons why Chinese workers are not appreciated after constructed? Kind of like, you know, they are not appreciated as uh, the main force of the uh, construction of the Chinese railroads after that. So why weren't they hired at first? They said, well, there was language difficulty, cultural distance, uh, the, the belief that Chinese weren't, have the physique or the stamina to do the kind of work. Just a logistical problem of how are you going <coughs> to manage so many workers, most of whom didn't speak English. So those are some of the issues. And they're just cultural or racial animus. That changed, as I said. And the Chinese have this, uh, I don't know, paradoxical now position that they have as being highly honored and celebrated as the best railroad construction workers in the nation. But that also meant they were seen as labor competitors. So the fact they were so good made them dangerous to those who thought, saw them as competing for jobs. And this, this uh, develops in the 1870s, crests in the late 1870s and early 1880s, and culminates, <coughs> well, it doesn't really culminate, but it, it results in 1882 with the first Chinese Exclusion Act. And it said explicitly in there is that the United States will not admit Chinese laborers to the United States because they were seen as labor competitors. So they were, so th this is part of the racialization of Chinese is that you could say they were seen as being too good of workers to be Americans. Dr. Chang, thanks for coming in and sharing your story. 
I had a chance to read your book. I saw you on uh, Sunday morning, uh, uh, CBS Sunday morning, a few uh, months ago. Um, I've always been fascinated by railroads since I was a child, and my older brother uh, uh, had a rabid interest as well. I thought I knew a fair amount about this uh, transcontinental railroad, but your book uh, not only did it share a lot of facts, but it humanized um, the workers. In all of your research, what surprised you the most? Well, almost everything. Uh, and I say that it's all seriousness because there was such a low level of knowledge, at least my knowledge. Uh, you know, Stephen Ambrose, David Howard Bain had written uh, uh, books, and they were, they were, they, they were decent efforts. <clears throat> but they never really captured, I think, the scale. So the scale, the number of workers. So we estimated, you know, how many? Somewhere between 10, 20,000. I estimate there are 20,000. Uh, because at the high point, there is maybe 15, even Leland Stanford says, we've got 15,000 Chinamen out there working. Well, at that one moment, but people didn't stay all the way through. Some people worked for a couple of months and left. So through turn oil, I just got to guess, you're going to have turn, turn, turnover. Uh, <clears throat> that's well, sort of one takeaway. You know, the other is the difficulty of the work conditions. And are we able to go in to look at the, correspond in, the private correspondence of the big four? as they were writing each other, because Carlos Huntington, who was head of the uh, raising capital back in New York, wanted to know what was going on. And so Charles Crocker and Charles Crocker's brother, E.B. Crocker, who had been a California Supreme Court justice and the treasurer of the CPRR, wrote him daily, almost daily, or sometimes two or three times a day, this is what's going on, because Huntington wants to know. And these letters would eventually get back east. So uh, Crocker <clears throat> is, is giving the inside dope on what's happening. And so we know something <coughs> about attitudes, construction progress, time, timing of all this, <coughs> and including things which I don't, didn't even mention, which I found really interesting, was the, in 1867, June, 3,000 of these workers went on strike. So they were not docile. They were not tractable. Uh, they were very disciplined. They worked hard. They were paid less. They worked in ways that, say, maybe some white workers said they would never work. They would not take this work. But they were not uh, docile. And in uh, Monday morning, eight, uh, June 22nd or 23rd, something, they didn't go to the line. And it completely took the company by surprise. They had no clue. Now, to organize something like this, 3,000 workers spread over 10 to 15 miles because the workers <laughs> don't work just at the head of the rail line. They work simultaneously among multiple sites because that's how you make maximum use of your time. And then you link all the sites together. They come together in multiple ways, kind of a time like this. So they're somehow they're living spread out over this long distance through the high Sierra, and they're communicating with each other, maybe you know, messages or something, talking or whatever it is, and they agree to the strike. They have demands, they present, they have leaders, they have organization. And they scare the bejeevers out of Charles Crocker, who came himself out from Sacramento to see what was going on. And there is a big labor confrontation. So this is the biggest strike in American history to that date. But if you look at any American history labor book, I ask you to look for any mention of that strike. You won't find it. Even in the great work of left-wing historians, such as Philip Foner, who wrote four-volume work on history of American working class, whatever it's called, it doesn't even mention this. Uh, so that was really a fascinating issue. Uh, and then I sort of, this intellectual, you know, what, what I really had a great revelation one day is because what I'm trying to do is put myself in their position. Think about what their life was like. So I can look out at the sky. I look at the terrain. I try to imagine what they saw. The Chinese were, were, were they, they were called celestials, right? And part of it is because they followed the lunar calendar. And so their rhythm of life is shaped by the lunar calendar. And the Chinese in Southern, California, uh, Southern China have all sorts of festivals, just, not just Chinese New Year's, or what we call Chinese New Year's, the beginning of the Lunar New Year, um, but other festivals to honor dead, honor this, all sorts of things. And that structures their existence. And in China, these things are followed quite literally religiously. Now, one of these events, <laughs> that's observed are the different nodal points in the year, the solstices. 
equinoxes, you know, the four points of the year. When did the strike happen? When did they take the strike? I think they took it the day of the summer equi uh, solstice. Solstice. Yeah, solstice. And that's a very auspicious time. I, I believe that. But it, that's what the auspicious time, and, the, and because of all sorts of belief. So part of understanding the rhythm of their life and work, it means understanding culturally something about who they were. <clears throat> so those are, those are a couple of big things. Uh, and then there are all, all the, how many died, uh, the use of uh, baskets. This was another big uh, controversy among historians, did Chinese actually hang in baskets from the top of the cliffs to work at the face of mountains, to hammer in, uh, make holes, put in the black powder, get hauled up, and hopefully a long burning fuse, and then, uh, and then blast away. And, and um, so there was a very heated controversy. You said some you have railroad, there are a lot of railroad historians, people, amateur railroad historians. And there's one, some people who were adamant that this was false, this was a myth, this was victim history. It never happened. The Chinese Americans are just making it up. But others were very, and not just Chinese Americans, others said, and said, yeah, it was true. You know, this has been handed down. This is, but it was a real issue. We couldn't find the documentation for this dramatic uh, image and dramatic incident. And so I spent a lot of time looking for stuff, and I found the stuff, I found the evidence. And I'm, I'm convinced. I went in wanting to believe it. Then I found up saying, I don't, maybe it didn't happen. And then I, but I went further, I round up saying it did happen. And we found newspaper articles written by journalists who witnessed the incident back from 1869, 1868, 1869. They saw, we saw Chinese hanging down a basket, woven baskets, putting in, di uh, not dynamite, but, but black powder. It's the difference between dynamite and black powder. And, setting off simultaneously these explosions that sent off hundreds of tons of rock down into the ravines below. Yes? They were paid in gold, yes. The Chinese have revered gold, as many cultures do. <clears throat> they didn't have trust in paper currency. Union Pacific workers were paid in currency, and they were paid significantly higher for doing similar types of work. The Chinese insisted on having cold hard cash, gold. I, I, but we're not sure they were paid in coin or dust or something like that, but they required gold. The big question is, what the heck did they do with it? Did they hide it under rocks? They didn't have Wells Fargo Bank. I mean, Wells Fargo was beginning at the time. There was no transfer of why, you know, why? So I called it ghost money. I don't know, ghost gold. I don't know what happened to it. So I thought, well, maybe, you know, if they sent back, we know they sent back lots of money to their home villages. Maybe they sent back their gold. <clears throat> maybe they sent back coins, so, you know, gold eagles or whatever it was called at the time. So I asked my colleagues in China, we have a lot of working relationship with Chinese, and I went on the internet. Have you found any American gold coins in China? Not one. Maybe, maybe some other here you would have. You know, because they're collectors of these collectors' items. Not one silver do uh, gold dollar, but lots of Mexican silver dollars. Because silver was used by the Chinese as their, their, their currency, the basis of their currency. So, the, so they had many foreign coins. And there, there are a lot of collectors in China of all sorts of fascinating Mexican minted coins, silver coins but not a single American gold coin. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. I appreciate your research and your coming to speak to us. Um, I have a few quick questions. Forgive me, I missed the first few minutes. So if you already covered something, you don't have to answer it. But uh, <laughs> um, first, I was curious, it was, it was all men, you said, and you said that there wasn't any written record. It was hard to find the history, so I'm curious I take it a lot of these men weren't able to read and write, many of them. And I'm curious also if they, where their families were, if they were all back in China, the mainland, if they went back to see them, or if there were families, and whether the kids were getting educated. Well, great, great questions. 
um, <clears throat> many of us believed we had no written records because they were all illiterate. <clears throat> we found that's not to be the case. A lot of <clears throat> observers at the time, including someone like Mark Twain, who was in California, said, look, a lot of these, Ch Ch they call them China, but, you know, they, they were, they were, they're more literate than other European immigrant were. He said, oh, they're all, they can read. They're, write, they're writing, they had letter writers. You could see them at, at rest, uh, and even some of the illustrations that accompanied these articles show Chinese railroad workers in their tents. They said, railroad workers at night. And what are they doing? They're lying down, reading by candlelight. They're reading. And so this is, this is something at the time that journalists uh, uh, observed. Can I ask one other question? Yeah, so about women and about families, is that many of them were married. The custom was to marry, the parents would want to marry the young one men because to make sure they would come back because they really wanted to have children and male heirs and all type of stuff. And so there were these, these tragic stories. I talk about this too, about the women. The women are not workers, but they're in the story because they're at home and they're also prostitutes. And that's a real tragic dimension of the story where we have so many of these young men and the bad elements in the community bring in young girls and they have a horrible existence as, as prostitutes, basically slaves that were going through all, through California, all throughout the West. And this became also very sensationalized and, and, and sad. You know, and it was another part of the story. So they're, they're, the women are there in other, full, other, other, way, other ways. But not school along the way. Yeah. Um, and the other question is, you said they were using Chinese technology. So I'm curious whether there were leaders, not just kind of on the, <clears throat> although there wasn't an HR, the labor side, but in terms of determining how the projects were going to be done, how, you know, This is what we will, we want to do a lot more work, and, and there's, we just haven't got good information yet. We, we talk to people, Chinese, and the question we pose is, what kind of construction technology, or in, what we call engineering technology, existed in China in the mid-19th century that they might have brought with them, including uh, uh, instruments for survey, for uh, figuring out level, land, uh, level of the land and all that stuff, which they were very pretty sophisticated, well, at that time sophisticated Western instruments. But we know just from a few newspaper articles that they talked about Chinese using their instruments. And they said in some ways that the Chinese instruments serve better purpose or more effect, more accurate. But we, we haven't been able to get very much more about, it, about that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is a fascinating book. I'm halfway through. I uh, just have a question. Um, you know, this part of the history, it was very important. Chinese in the early days contributed to building the America. Uh, so what do you, what is your next step? What is your obligation uh, to bring this out to public, I know you're going to have book tours. Hopefully, you sell a lot of, a lot of books. But <laughs> me too. <laughs> but, but other than that, how do we actually bring this part of the history to the public? I know that, like in high school, you know, if they if they teach uh, world history, the world history textbooks about China, maybe there are five pages at the most. So, but this is Asian American, Chinese American history, which is different from studying history about China. So in a way, it's more important for Chinese Americans or Americans in general to learn about it. So what is our obligation and your next step to try to promote that aspect? Well, I like your question or comment. And I'm, I'm look, thinking here. When you're used to the word obligation, uh, uh, and I don't don't feel that I'm put upon. But but an obligation as as a historian, as a scholar, as a person of the community, as a citizen, we we do have history does oblige us in many ways. Obliges us to think about our collective past, what it means for us today. So I like that. And I like the idea 
that I'm a, now that I have all this work, and you know, it's not, I'm not just going to be able to be up in front talking, but, but I am obliged. Uh, the, the spirits are expecting me to do something with this knowledge now, as now all of you are, you know, by implication. That, that's what I mean. Maybe I'm thinking in Chinese. I, I'm thinking about zhe right? Uh, which is slightly different from the English term obligation. Responsibility more. Yeah. yeah. Well, both, but, both. I mean, yes. I, I think we, we, history, if we're really feeling people and citizens, you know, genuine caring, have a real civic consciousness, you know, history lays upon all of us all sorts of responsibilities. I, I think that's a wonderful idea to, to keep in mind. Whatever, you know, there are all sorts of things, not just this, there are all sorts of topics that uh, I think are important to make us as good citizens. But uh, more, more, more specifically, we also have a public dimension of our project. We develop curriculum. So we have a curriculum unit that uh, colleagues at Stanford developed for K through 12. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's great. And we have storyboards we've developed that have been circulated in maybe 50 different locations around the country, libraries and, and post offices have this, and, and trying to, to, to help others understand this as part of our collective past. Yes, thank you so much. I think this is a very significant step. Thank, thank you. you. Um, hello, this is Professor Chan. Yes, thank you. Yes. Um, so thank you so much. I, even as a uh, Chinese American or Asian American, I didn't know so much that you talked about today. I'm sure you just kind of glimpsing the surface here. So I'm wondering, how did you acquire an interest in studying history and Chinese history in America? Well, I can get philosophical. How did I get interested in history? I mean, maybe it's just in my, I don't, I don't know. I came, I tell my students this, and they always blink. I said, I, when I was in high school, the last thing I thought it would become in life as a historian, because I hated high school history. I thought it was deadly, you know, it was just boring. Until I got, uh, who it was I was, uh, we were talking about college and some of the professors that we've uh, shared. And then, I, and then I opened my eyes open. The history is not just an accumulation of facts and dates and big people and all this, but it's really about humans. You know, when I really, but the, and there's so much history. But to learn about ourselves, to learn about the human past, that's what history is. And when making it began, if it's political, political dimensions, religious dimensions, whatever, is really studying, in, in a simple sense, you know, humanity. And, and so I, I love it now, you know. Um, and I, that's what I try to convey to my students, too, is because they're all interested about, you know, coding or, and, and, you know, how to make it better this or better that. But I said, you know, you know we want to ultimately education, stand wherever, is to make, better hum make us better humans, be able to think, certainly, but also have our values and ethics and uh, our feeling of, uh, of co-humans. <clears throat> Uh, on this topic, you know, I, as I grew up in California, I'm fourth generation Californian. So my ancestry goes back to the 1850s. I don't think I had any railroad ancestors in my past, but I know my great grandfather and grandfather encountered railroad workers because they lived right next to them. I mean, they, one of my great grandfather was a storekeeper and one of the jump on off points for the railroad. So he must have had railroad workers come into his store. But so I was always interested growing up. So like you say, a lot of the young Asian Americans nowadays are great programmers or uh, STEM, studying STEM. So do you have students or Asian Americans interested in studying Asian American history in, in America? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying they all should become historians by far, by far from it. But to complement, to supplement their study of technology, of engineering, of science, of biology, to become doctors, you know, a good doctor is not just a technician. A good doctor is a human being. It has values, has some connection to other humans. And I think part, history helps to convey that. Uh, so that's why I'm a, I call a humanist. A humanist is someone who, I think, uh, is someone who studies the fuzzy world, philosophy, literary criticism, art history, but also I think many his, humanists hope that we are able to convey a, a sense of our collective humanity to those who come after her. <coughs> Thank you.
That's very tough. Thank you very much. That's very meaningful. That's great. Thank, you very much. Thank you so much, Gordon. And we have books over there. Thank you. Thank you. Can I have uh, just one last question, maybe a fitting uh, question for the end of this, this topic? Uh, I heard recently that the, at the end of the construction of the railroad, that the Chinese were not allowed to ride the train to get back, that they actually had to walk. Is this true? Again, I, I, there are lots of myths. I don't think that's true. Because the workers actually were, were, were uh, desired. They, they, went all, they went the other way, in fact. A lot of workers went east and south. They went down to Tennessee, Alabama to build regional lines, down Arizona. Went all the way out to Long Island. I mean, we know this because our newspaper, local newspapers say 300 Chinamen came into town today to work in Tuscaloosa. And these were, these were, we, these were, very, and they, these, they all came from the Central Pacific and they came here in the early, you know, late 1869, early 1870. Thank you.